Hey everyone. This episode I wanted to talk about a question that I get asked a whole heap within uh, agile ways of working, new ways of working, when we're talking about breaking work down into small chunks. And that question is, I get this agile thing, I get that we want to break work down into small chunks, I get that we want to make smaller commitments, conceptually I get this idea of more regular feedback loops, but if we're only ever looking at the small pieces of work, then how do we see further than what's right in front of our nose? How do we how do we take that strategic view? How do I keep the big picture in my head when I've got the super fragmented small chunks of work? It's a common complaint, um, particularly as we're starting into agile ways of working, particularly when we're starting out and you've probably got an agile coach in there who's saying, no more big projects, no more big schedules. We're going to smash all of that and we're going to do two-week iterations of work and you're going to deliver something every two weeks. And quite rightly, a lot of my executive clients have a mild panic attack at that point. So what I want to share with you today was the tool that I use and the concept that I use to help keep that visibility of the big picture. So this month's all about alignment, right? And that is, so today it's about how do we align the work that we're doing to the bigger picture? How do we keep that visibility in our head? Because it's no use everybody going and doing a bunch of fragmented work and then hoping that that all adds up to something better. Great, if you've got the ability to go and work in two weekly iterations and just keep delivering something for customers, but like a lot of us don't work in that environment either. A lot of us don't have like IT platforms that allow us to do that. A lot of us have bigger pieces that a business unit or a different stakeholder is asking us to do, and we can't, we don't have the luxury of being able to say, hey, what can we do in two weeks that we can deliver? We have to keep that big picture, right? And particularly in corporate and enterprise where um, we've we've often got strategy, um, we've got all, there's all sorts of stuff that's going on in the organization that's still very much at that kind of macro big picture level. Uh, and so we need to build those bridges. We need to make sure that we are lining up and making visible how the stuff that we're doing today is having impact and improvement and how it lines up with the bigger picture. So today is about lining up with the bigger picture. Less about impact, but more about lining up with the big picture, right? So the story I tell here is this idea of a tale of two projects. So as you all know, project management background, right? Like went and did a master's in it, for goodness sake. Uh, but it's my passion, like I love it, and traditional project management, uh, I was taught, among, like most of us were taught, you, you go through this process of sit down, and first thing you do is you start to understand what the problem is you're trying to do, and then you, you develop a set of requirements that go along with this, um, in terms of what your project needs to deliver. Uh, once you've got that clear set of business requirements, then you start to design a solution that meets those requirements. And after you've designed the solution, you might send that out for somebody to build in some way, shape or form, uh, whether that's IT or buildings, the build phase. Uh, there's usually some form of testing phase, might be commissioning if you're out in construction land. Um, and then after you get through all of that, there's a point where you go, yep, we're going to make it live. And so if we were to look at this idea of value or benefit delivered over time, if we were to draw a little graph where time is on the horizontal axis, that, that passage of time horizontally, and value or benefit, the cumulative delivery of value or benefit was on the vertical axis. In a traditional project management approach where we go requirements, design, build, test, deploy, or deliver, that graph of cumulative benefit or value delivered over time looks like a whole lot of nothing all the way through requirements, all the way through design, all the way through build, it, we could be halfway through building an IT system and we don't even know if it's going to fly in production yet, right? We've had very little delivered in terms of there's no customers act actively using it. We, if, if you're building software, 
then like maybe you start to get some input around the testing phase, but there's a whole lot of nothing delivered until right at the very end. And then once we go into that sort of user acceptance testing, you know, deployments into production, actually giving that to customers in the marketplace to use, then we get a chance for feedback. That's when we've said, yep, we've delivered the value or the benefit. And, and so that curve looks like a giant ski jump, as I call it. A whole lot of nothing, and then hopefully it all happens at the end. And in the world that I grew up in, that stuff could take years. And so we would spend all this time focusing on business planning and making sure that we got our modeling right because you had a three to five year window to run before the thing was going to work. And so you want to be very, very sure that you were building the right thing. That's obviously changed a lot uh, in, in the last few years. And, and so when we look at more agile and responsive ways of working, that graph of a whole lot of nothing and then a bunch of stuff that we hope works at three to five years from now, our environment doesn't, like that just doesn't work anymore. We have so many pressures for change and speed to market and all these things going on in our business lives that means that that graph of, of benefits delivered at the end is just no longer acceptable for us or for our stakeholders. And so we've got to change it up. And so welcome to the rise of agile ways of working, right? And building responsive organizations. How do we get that value and that benefit out the door more quickly? How do we make sure that we are getting feedback from our customers? How do we orient around what's important? Before we break it down into small chunks. So what does that look like to then hang that back together? Well, if we were to take the same project, but instead of trying to understand everything up front and then build, we broke that into a bunch of outcomes or epics or user stories, depending on how deep you are into the agile lingo, we would break it into a series of tangible outcomes. So take that big picture and maybe to start with, we break it into five or six key pieces. And we want to deliver those five or six key pieces independently and potentially in some form of sequence. So we're not going to start all of them together. We're going to sequence those things towards the greater whole. So at the start of the project, we, we have this idea that it's these five or six things and that will get us the totality. What you can do is you can take each of those outcomes, so having broken the work down, and do a really quick, I'm talking finger in the air exercise of what's the value associated with each of those components. Maybe we've got a 10%, a 20%, a 50%, a 20 and a, I can't do maths, but up to the 100% of cumulative benefits and value. Let's break that down and, and do a really quick assessment of where we think we're going to have the biggest impact across those five or six different outcomes. And then what we can choose to do is we can choose to sequence that work. So in a perfect world, we do the first piece. We deliver that all the way into production. We understand feedback from our customers, from our stakeholders as to whether and how that's beneficial. And then we make some choices about the next piece of work. So what you want to do is you want to take those five or six outcomes with the percentage of value that's, uh, that you've prescribed to each. And we want to graph that, same as we did for our initial project on time on the horizontal scale and benefits or value on the vertical. And so if we were to sequence those pieces of work so that they drop at five, there's five or six different value drops throughout the project, right? Rather than the one at the end, there's five or six different value drops. And when you sequence that work in a way that makes sense, then what you can start to do is you'll notice that that curve changes. So it will change from a ski jump and it will probably start to look more like an S curve or a straight line. Because what we're doing is we are delivering a discrete piece of value at each point. And so every time we deliver, we lock it in. So that little value increment jumps up before we get right to the end. And so you build this S curve. You build this, uh, this incremental delivery. 
the other really cool thing that happens when you start to when you when you start to see this picture, what you'll notice is a couple of things. First off, you'll notice that to deliver those five or six outcomes, probably still going to take you the same amount of time had you chosen to take a traditional project management approach and just deliver everything at the end, right? Agile's not quicker. However, because you've broken it down into small chunks, you are getting value delivered incrementally. It feels quicker because you've got something out the door. You're building that momentum. So it's going to feel a lot faster, even if it takes you the same amount of time to get to the overall outcome. So that's the first thing you'll notice. I have a cat visiting me again today. So <laughs> apologies in advance for... Um, the camera's shaking and the and the little kitty interjections. Uh, so that, that's the first thing you're going to notice, right, is that you've got these incremental deliveries of value. So it takes you the same amount of time to get the overall outcome, but because we're delivering regularly, you're going to feel faster. The other thing that's going to happen is that you're creating a chance to make decisions throughout the lifetime of that project. And so the point that you deliver the first piece of value, you have a decision point. Based on what you've learned, you can choose to continue with the plan as you first conceived of it. You might choose to just keep going. That might make sense. You could choose to stop because it's not actually having the impact that you thought it was going to have. So you could choose to stop. You could shut it down and you no longer have the sunk costs fallacy because you've delivered something all the way through and you've learned from it, right? And so it's not like stopping a project when you're in the middle of build and you've wasted all of that time and effort and investment. Actually, you got something out the door and you learned from it. Your third option is to pivot. So maybe based on what we learned and put into production, we don't want to keep going with what we're doing. We've actually learned that there's another path to get to that better outcome for customers or stakeholders. We want to pivot the work that we're doing. So we're not going to take the original plan. We're not going to stop. We're going to pivot. And so every time you deliver one of those five or six chunks, you get the chance to make that set of three decisions. Do we start? Do we stop? Do we pivot? So that's the second thing you're going to notice. The third thing that you're going to notice, and this is, this is the master stroke. This is the 80-20 rule in action. What you're going to start to see is that as you progress through that S-curve of value or benefit delivered, you're going to spend money through that process. And at some point, you're going to get to a point where you've delivered around 80% of the value of the thing that you started with. And because you're working sequentially and because you're working with these independently valuable chunks, you have the opportunity to ask, is that enough? And so what happens is when you get this process right, you'll find a crossover point where you've probably spent somewhere in the order of 50 to 70% of the money, and you've delivered 80 to 90% of the value, and you get to ask that question, is this enough? Do we want to spend a big chunk of money to finish off the last piece of value? And there's very good reasons for doing that. Compliance projects are one of them. Or do we want to stop? We've got 80% of it. Let's reposition our focus and go on to something else that's more important for the organization. So you get a whole bunch of benefit. Not only do you get to keep the sense of the big picture because you are talking about the outcome as a whole and you're breaking work down into small chunks so that you can see that alignment with the total outcome, but you also get the chance for feedback. You get the chance to make decisions about whether you start, stop, continue. You get the chance to make a decision about whether or not you've had enough, and you could reposition your resources elsewhere. So that's it from me this week. If you want the little worksheets that go along with this, reminder, come on over to the mailing list, DM me, send me a message, send me an email. Um, you can sign up on the website too, and I'll give you the worksheets that go along with this little video so that you can start to implement this in your own organization. You can start to break work down into small chunks, keep that strategic vision, uh, and implement some of these visuals to help your team stay focused in the right areas. That's it from me. Uh, I hope wherever you are in the world, you're having an awesome, awesome day. And I'll see you again really, really soon.